Black-handed, or Jeffrey spider monkeys, once were found in forests from northeastern Mexico through Central America to Colombia. Now they're gone from most of the range shown in green, but they still can be found at least in small numbers in each of these countries. Here we look at some of their natural history in Costa Rica. Spider monkeys leap, run, and swing through the trees like long-armed acrobats with magical tails. The way they swing, arms extended, hand over hand, is called brachiation. Most other kinds of monkey can't do it. It requires flexible wrists and a special kind of shoulder anatomy. And to help them travel and hang and even pick up tiny objects, they have the best tail in the monkey world. It's a prehensile tail that's so strong and sensitive it's as good as an extra hand or foot. The monkeys can hang by the tail alone, which leaves hands and feet free for other activities. Monkeys with prehensile tails are found only in the New World tropics, and with one exception only in the family Atelidae. The Atelids are large monkeys that eat mostly fruit and leaves. Anchored by the prehensile tail, these relatively heavy monkeys can safely reach food that's far out on thin branches. Spider monkeys are one of the biggest monkeys in the Americas. Long-armed, lanky, and sort of spidery. If you could hold one in your arms, you'd have an armful, and an adult draped on your shoulders would weigh you down some 15 pounds or more. In Costa Rica, the color of their fur varies from place to place, from tan to reddish to dark brown or nearly black. Back in 1806, a French naturalist named the spider monkey genus Ateles, from the Greek word meaning imperfect or incomplete, because spider monkey hands are missing something. Unlike almost every other primate, their hands have no external thumbs, or sometimes just a tiny remnant of one. It's often said that spider monkeys lost their thumbs so that they could brachiate better, and it seems this must be true. But would having thumbs really make it harder to brachiate? The gibbons of tropical Asia still have their thumbs, and yet are the most spectacular of all the brachiators. All we can say is that spider monkeys evolved on a different continent under different selective pressures. Getting rid of thumbs must have worked for them. Without thumbs on their hands, spider monkeys can't manipulate things as well as some of the other monkeys can. But their feeding style doesn't require much dexterity, and most of them rarely, if ever, use objects as tools. Spider monkeys specialize in eating ripe fruit. It makes up 70 to 80 percent of their diet. Because of the great biodiversity of tropical forests, there are likely to be hundreds of different kinds of fruiting trees within the range of a single troop of monkeys. But the ones with ripe fruit are likely to be widely scattered through the forest. Every day, the monkeys have to find them. And, oh yes, there are lots of other fruit eaters who are going to take some of that ripe fruit for themselves. When spider monkeys arrive at the fruit stand, they may find that all the ripe fruit has already been taken. And to add to the problem, howler monkeys often eat the unripe fruit too. Nevertheless, with a multitude of different kinds of plants to feed from, you would think that nobody should go hungry. And the problem for spider monkeys is that trees or other plants with ripe fruit often are nowhere near each other. What's a monkey to do? 
because trees and other plants with ripe fruit tend to be widely scattered through the forest, spider monkeys have become adapted to traveling fast and far over a large home range. They usually don't linger in any one tree unless it's loaded with high quality ripe fruit. Normally, they quickly eat what's ripe and then they're off in a direct line to the next tree on their agenda for that day. How do they know where to go? Of all the world's monkeys, these are one of the smartest with large and complex brains. They develop a mental map of their part of the forest. School for young monkeys is learning where the fruiting trees are, learning to keep tabs on the ripening of the fruit in each tree, learning to check for the flowers that are good to eat and for the arrival of tender new leaves. Not so easy in this multi-layered, extremely complex environment. Tropical forests in general are packed with more species of plants than any other forest on Earth. And so spider monkeys are smart monkeys, but how smart? The conclusions of a recently published meta-analysis of primate intelligence might be surprising. Spider monkeys were ranked number three among the monkeys and apes, just behind orangutans and chimpanzees. Here are the top ten. Why should spider monkeys be so smart? There is evidence that a fruit-eating lifestyle goes hand in hand with a larger brain and greater intelligence. Spider monkey brains are twice the size of the brains of the mostly leaf-eating howler monkeys. Reliably locating fruit apparently requires more information storage and processing power. At the same time, fruit supplies the quick and abundant energy that a large brain needs. Monkeys that eat fruit and travel a long way every day are excellent as seed dispersers. Seed dispersal is crucial for the health of the forest. Plants want their fruit to be eaten so that the seeds inside will be transported somewhere else because seeds that accumulate below the parent tree are easily found and destroyed by beetles and other seed predators. The tree wants those seeds to be carried away and scattered then they'll be more likely to survive and prosper. Most tropical trees depend on animals rather than wind to disperse their seeds. Fruit-eating birds usually swallow fruits whole and regurgitate large seeds. And it's good for the plant if the bird has flown some distance away before it ejects the seed from one end or the other. Spider monkeys usually swallow small fruits whole, or they give them very little chewing and don't spit out the seeds. About four hours later, out come the seeds, undamaged. In fact, many seeds germinate better after their internal journey through the monkey. Spider monkeys are also important in the lives of other animals. Yes, big cats, eagles, and boa constrictors sometimes have them for dinner, but the monkey's major contribution comes from their own sloppy eating habits. Many forest floor animals need the fruit or nuts that fall from above. A group of feeding monkeys can make the food rain down noisily. It's like a dinner bell for peccaries, agoutis, and other animals on the ground. It means they can get the fruit before it's quickly spoiled by insects and microorganisms. The crunching we hear means death to the seed. In this case, the peccaries are seed predators, not seed dispersers.
Many different species of palm trees are common in Costa Rican forests, from the understory to the canopy, and they're one of the prime food sources for many tropical forest animals. Their fruits are often one of the few foods available in times of scarcity. When monkeys and other animals go to work on a cluster of palm fruits, the ground below looks like a trash heap. But this is when other animals take over. Even monkeys, who could climb to the fruit, sometimes find it more convenient to let someone else knock it down for them. Doesn't this look like a fruit eater's delight? But look at the trunk of one of these trees. From the ground up, the long, sharp spines are worse than a barbed wire fence. The palm seems to want to keep monkeys and climbing animals away from its attractive fruits, probably so that the fruits won't be damaged before they're ripe and ready to fall. Because of the spines, most fruit eaters without wings are out of luck, but this is where long arms and a prehensile tail come in handy. The monkeys don't do much to disperse the palm fruit seeds. They're too big to swallow, and so they're either dropped below the tree or carried away only a short distance. Trees with large or heavy seeds have another strategy for dispersing their seeds, as we'll see in a minute. The monkeys only eat the flesh surrounding the seed. It's tough and fibrous, not sweet, but it's a good source of vitamins, minerals, and protein. A curious thing about New World monkeys, unlike their Old World counterparts, is that most of the species in the Americas can only see the colors blue and green. None of the spider monkey males that eat these pretty orange fruits can see that color, and only about half of the females can. It's a product of a sex-linked gene mutation that apparently occurred early in their evolution. We don't know how this affects their ability to identify ripe fruit, but much of the fruit in their diet doesn't turn red or orange anyway. In fact, monkeys may select fruit more by its odor than by its color. And there is some evidence that the monkeys who don't see red and orange find it easier to notice fruit in dim light, or when the fruit is about the same color as the surrounding foliage. Dispersal of the hard and heavy palm seeds is done best by big rodents of the forest floor. Agoutis love to get them, and then they kill them by chewing them up. But the tree drops too much fruit to be eaten at once. So the agoutis carry some of the seeds away and bury them. If the seed is not retrieved, it may germinate and grow. Agoutis steal each other's buried seeds, and with each reburial the seed gets carried a little farther from the parent tree, increasing its chances of survival, exactly what the tree would have wanted. Just as monkeys need forest, forest needs monkeys. But today, spider monkeys are gone from many forests. Some have been hunted out. Some have been starved out when farms have eaten up the landscape. 
when the last patches of forest are too small. When these important fruit-eating seed dispersers are gone, the forest itself will begin to change. Spider monkeys also eat flowers and tender young leaves. But leaves in a forest aren't the same as lettuce in a garden. Plants want their fruit to be eaten. Plants don't want their leaves to be eaten. And, therefore, they do something about it. We've bred the toxins out of our food plants, but most wild plants still supply their leaves with nasty or poisonous compounds, often when they're young and tender. But the monkeys need these leaves for the protein and minerals they don't get in fruit. So how to keep from being poisoned? Learn to recognize the safe plants, or don't eat too many leaves from any one plant. The monkeys' bodies like ours usually can deal with a small amount of poison. Here the monkeys have come down to the understory to feed on a flush of tender new leaves. New leaves often are pale tan or reddish. The plant doesn't bother to give them the green chlorophyll of photosynthesis until they've escaped the hazards of youth. Because everybody likes to eat those tender new leaves. The old leaves are tough, hard to digest, and usually are left alone by the monkeys and most other leaf eaters if they have a choice. Sloths are the champion leaf eaters, with stomachs that are specialized for processing leaves. But even they avoid most of the mature leaves. This two-toed sloth in an Indian almond tree chooses the new leaves and the fruit. The mature leaves are full of bitter tannins and a host of other potent compounds. The leaves have been used by humans to treat dysentery and diarrhea. Not all trees have dangerous leaves, and one of the most common that doesn't is the Cecropia. There are many species, but they all have very large and multi-lobed leaves and cigar-shaped fruits. You usually see them in disturbed areas in or on the edge of the forest. Cecropia is like a grocery store for wildlife. Howler monkeys, sloths, and many other herbivores seem to eat the leaves with impunity. And so do spider monkeys. In many old cecropias, feeding insects or their larvae have perforated the leaves like buckshot. The flowers and fruit, more nutritious and easier to digest, are eaten by almost anybody. One biologist recorded 28 species of vertebrates eating cecropia fruit in northwestern Costa Rica. Cecropia is not always easy picking, however. Different species of Azteca ants often live in Cecropia's hollow stems. Tapping on or shaking younger trees can bring out hordes of ants ready to bite and drive off the intruder. They seem to be especially interested in keeping leafcutter ants away. Why are leafcutter ants so dangerous? Monkeys and other vertebrate leaf eaters usually will eat a few leaves and then move on. But a mature colony of leafcutter ants, several million strong, sometimes working day and night, 
could strip a young Cecropia bear in a day or two. If a plant could be afraid of anything, leafcutter ants might be at the head of its list. All those little pieces of leaf go into underground chambers where the ants use them to grow a fungus garden. The fungus eats the leaves, the ants eat the fungus. As the plants in the forest are busy making chemicals for their own needs, scientists are busy trying to find plants they can use for drugs, medicines, or cosmetics. Monkeys already know about some of these. What's going on here? Sometimes monkeys rub the paste from certain kinds of chewed leaves into their fur. Why they do it, only the monkeys know for sure. Some leaves would repel insects and parasites. Others may just be for perfume. Because spider monkeys only anoint themselves on the chest, where they already have scent glands, they probably do it for the smell rather than for medicine or repellent. It's more often done by males. Maybe they do it to impress each other, or maybe they just have females in mind. Spider monkey troops often have about 30 individuals, but everybody is usually not together at any one time. It's called a fission fusion society, and is usually seen to some degree in most group living animals. The troop often will be split into subgroups of only a few individuals, or perhaps a solitary female or a mother with her infant. This helps them reduce competition and aggression when fruit is scarce. When food is abundant, and at the end of each day, everybody tends to come together again. It's the females who are most often seen alone. This is especially true of low-ranking females and females with young. Females may be mistaken for males because of the male-like shape of their genital area in the form of a long and pendulous clitoris. Only a few other mammals share this characteristic. In spider monkeys, it may be important in sexual scent marking. It also may identify gender from a distance, perhaps useful in a species whose males and females are nearly the same size and are not always together as a troop. As a rule, female spider monkeys leave their birth troop when they reach maturity. Eventually, they'll join a new troop and its females, all of whom also will have been born elsewhere. This probably is a difficult time for the new immigrant. For a while, she will have to appease the older females and often suffer their attacks. Males, on the other hand, usually stay at home in their birth troop. They hang out together, travel, feed, rest, and play together. Perhaps because they're often closely related, brothers, half-brothers, or cousins. They usually get along with each other much better than do the males of most other species of monkeys. Here in the afternoon, a group of males rests, or doesn't rest, on the wide branch of a tall tree. In spider monkey troops, there's no tyrant king. But among the males, there will be a hierarchy. And younger males especially may have to work at easing the tension between themselves and older males. You don't often see spider monkeys groom each other the way some other monkeys do. 
For instance, these capuchin monkeys form friendships and alliances by grooming, and they spend a lot of time at it. But spider monkeys make friends and allies by hugging or embracing each other. In this afternoon social session, young males line up to play and learn their place in the social order. Young males can get away with teasing and tussling each other, but they have to be careful how they act with older males. This grappling behavior between sub-adult and adult males probably reduces aggression. The younger males usually initiate it. Younger males give more embraces than they receive. Their relationship with older males is a risky one, and it's wise to curry favor with those who are bigger and stronger. In a nearby tree, the macaws are also socializing. It looks and sounds quarrelsome, but it probably is just the opposite. Unlike the monkeys, the macaws form pair bonds that may last a lifetime. Also, unlike the monkeys, the macaws mostly are seed predators, not seed dispersers. They want the seed inside the fruit, not the pulp around it. In this India almond tree, they tear off and drop the flesh from the fruit. Then they open up, and slice the seed with their strong beaks. No teeth, no chewing. A muscular stomach or gizzard grinds up the pieces of hard nut. Like the agoutis and other seed eaters, the macaws have been called illegitimate fruit eaters. They cheat the plant's intended function of fruit by killing its seeds rather than by dispersing them. The ring on the bird's foot shows that it was captive raised and released as part of a project to reintroduce macaws or increase their population. Once widespread in the country, loss of habitat and hunting for the pet trade have greatly reduced their numbers. As young males grow older, they spend less and less time with their mothers and other females and begin hanging out with adult males. These males seem to be content to have this youngster's company. One of them may well be its father. There's some evidence that juvenile males inherit dominance from their mothers. In other words, high-status females have high-status sons, and these privileged little monkeys are more likely to be accepted by adult males. It's a complex society, and young monkeys have to learn how to make their way in it. This little monkey probably gains points by licking the wounded heel of the big monkey. Its saliva will clean and disinfect the wound. The afternoon is not entirely peaceful. When capuchin monkeys show up, there's a brief standoff. Capuchins tend to be meddlesome monkeys that stir up trouble just for the heck of it. These two linger a few minutes with a show of teeth, but then quit while they're ahead. The spider monkeys are quite a bit larger, and there are too many to intimidate or chase out of the tree.
With monkeys, as with macaws, sociability doesn't come without conflict. Spider monkey females squabble with each other. Males often are sexually aggressive toward females. Juveniles may screech at their mothers in protest when they're no longer allowed to nurse. And older males sometimes attack younger males. They don't want to have to compete with them for mating opportunities. Later, down below on the edge of the trees, the young capuchins are having fun. Relations between spider and capuchin monkeys are not always troubled. The teenagers of both species sometimes play together. How can a monkey resist this much fun? Especially when you're invited. A hapless agouti, hoping for fallen fruit, wanders into the playground. In the 17th century, the pirate William Dampier forced to hunt game for food in Mexico and Central America was taken aback by spider monkey males. If they meet with a single person, he wrote, they will threaten to devour him. When I've been alone, I've been afraid to shoot them. They were chattering and making a terrible noise and a great many grim faces and showing antic gestures. Males can be quite aggressive toward humans. When approached in confined or unnatural situations, they have attacked and severely bitten people. Against spider monkeys from other troops, they can be deadly. Groups of them patrol the borders of their territory and their job is to repel males from other troops, which may be done with shouting matches or with displays of power and ferocity like this. Occasionally they may fight and even send raiding parties into another troop's territory. This brazen shaking the branches aimed at enemies down below has gotten many a monkey killed by human hunters who took advantage of an exposed and stationary target. But monkeys who have been hunted learn to hide or to flee from humans. They may sit perfectly still, hidden by leaves and branches, or attempt to sneak away as quickly and silently as possible. Some troops in protected areas are not afraid to go shopping, or shoplifting, around human habitations. Sometimes they raid orchards and cornfields. At this nature lodge, surrounded by forest off limits to hunters, monkeys often visit the mango orchard. They sample the fruit with a few bites from several, leaving damaged mangoes still hanging or knocked to the ground. But even here the monkeys are wary, not quite comfortable this close to the ground in the vicinity of people. And there's always the chance that the males from a rival troop will be lurking nearby. It's obvious why these visits would not be endearing to a farmer or a commercial orchard grower.
From the Amazon to Mexico, spider monkeys are hunted for bush meat. They're said to be the best tasting of all the monkeys. In some places, they're preferred over any other game animal. And where they're not eaten by people, they may be shot to feed a hunter's dogs. It's not easy for hunters to find game in the dark interior of a tropical forest or in the overgrown jungle of the forest edge. Furthermore, many of the forest animals are active only at night. So it turns out that monkeys, and especially spider monkeys, are often the easiest game animals to find. They're big, active in daylight, usually occur in groups, have noisy vocalizations, and often crash through the branches when they travel. In naive populations, one or more of them may even stop to threaten the hunter. Roads through the forest let hunters in. Without protection, the monkeys are shot out, especially in second-growth forests, where they may have to forage closer to the ground. But there still are some large expanses of roadless forest left in the country. This is where the monkeys can thrive. Hunters can't easily find them. Many of these forests are at least nominally protected as national parks or forest reserves. Porcovado National Park here in the southwest has the highest density of spider monkeys ever sampled. Spider monkeys don't quickly recover from a loss of population. It takes a female four or five years to reach sexual maturity, but she usually will be six, seven, or even eight years old before she has her first baby. After that, she may give birth to a single young every two to four years. Most of the other American monkeys breed at an earlier age and then give birth more frequently. With spider monkeys, the relationship between mother and offspring is a long one. The mother will carry her baby everywhere for about three months. For the first one and a half to two months, the black-furred infant clings to the mother's chest, where it can easily nurse without having to move far. After that, it rides on her back and begins to eat some solid food, but it will continue to nurse until it's more than a year old, and the pampered ones might still be nursing after two years. Then, especially if it's a female, it's likely to hang around the mother for several years, often sitting nearby and watching when the mother mates again. Spider monkeys once were found throughout most of Costa Rica, from the mountains to the sea, almost wherever there was forest. Today, except in the country's parks and reserves, most of the forest either is gone or is too small to support the monkeys. And so, most people only see spider monkeys in the zoo. Where here in the gesture toward ending the pet trade, they're told that spider monkeys aren't happy as pets, 
They need to live with other spider monkeys, free in the forest, we assume. Sometimes they're encountered as undernourished and sadly shackled captives tied up on the grounds of jungle lodges. And they frequently show up in the menagerie at wildlife rehabilitation centers where they've been deposited after being found injured or they've been rescued as infants after the mother has been shot. Under the best of conditions, some can successfully be returned to the wild. Yes, the poaching of monkeys, as well as other wild animals, for food and the pet trade is still a problem. But for the most part, spider monkeys and other game animals are relatively safe in Costa Rica's parks and private reserves. The country has banned sport hunting, and it has made it illegal to keep wild animals as pets or to exhibit them in commercial operations. All New World monkeys need forest, but as we've seen, spider monkeys need more than the others. Given protection, they can thrive in Costa Rica's large parks and forest reserves. And since hunting has been curtailed, they and other game animals have been slowly returning to some forests where they had been hunted out. But the smaller parks, even if they can support a few monkeys, present them with a special problem, inbreeding. Where can they find a mate that's not a close relative? The next nearest troop of monkeys may be far away, across farms or pastures, towns or highways. The monkeys are reluctant to cross open land to get from one patch of forest to another. When the distance becomes too great, they remain as an isolated population subject to inbreeding. Inbreeding leads to loss of genetic diversity that may cause the fitness of a population to suffer. What can be done? If a small forest fragment can't be expanded, in many cases, it can be connected to other forests by creating biological corridors. This is done by planting or leaving narrow strips of trees the monkeys can use as aerial highways between the forests. This thin corridor follows a stream and connects two forest fragments across an otherwise treeless farmland. And riverbank forests could make wonderful corridors that extend for long distances and connect many forest fragments. By law, no one is allowed to cut the forest along the banks of rivers but the law hasn't been enforced. Save or replant the riverside forest, and monkeys would have a narrow but usable road to get from one patch of forest to another. This is often the easiest and quickest way to make a biological corridor, since the forest has a legal right to be there and shouldn't have been cut in the first place. Forest along riverbanks also would slow the massive amount of soil erosion from farmlands. After heavy rains, the rivers can run red with sediment that flows into the sea. Biological corridors don't have to be good habitat. They just have to provide safe passage. Pine trees are not native to Costa Rica, and this mountain pine forest originally planted for timber, has almost nothing the monkeys can use for food. But it makes a good road to take them from one native forest to another. They use it almost every day.
monkeys attract tourists. And it has been good business for some landowners to keep their forest and protect its wildlife. Of course, other kinds of business have no use for monkeys and trees and have caused massive deforestation. Throughout the country, you see field after field like this, with grass-fed cattle for the export beef industry. And most of the great rainforests of the eastern and southwestern lowlands have been replaced with massive plantations of bananas, oil palms, and other crops. Nature tourism and export agriculture compete for land and foreign exchange, but the two are incompatible land use strategies. The problem of both doing business and keeping nature is a thorny one, but Costa Rica has done a very good job of it. More than one quarter of the country's territory is under some category of protection, and that percentage is increasing. Some of the national parks and private reserves are so heavily visited they may be loved to death. Other parks, larger and less visited, have kept their wildness. Today in Costa Rica, many landowners are keeping their forest, or allowing it to regrow. A government program rewards them for this. And nature tourism dollars are even a greater incentive for some. The tourists expect to see monkeys, and saving forest for monkeys, and saving the monkeys from hunting, means most of the other animals benefit too. They're safely under the monkey's umbrella.